pleasant good afternoon to everyone. Except for you, Megan, I don't know anyone at that school, and I'm upset now. <laughs> so we'll certainly be praying for you, and uh, pray that God's uh, will and intervention will uh, take place, and all your credits will be transferable to the new place. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I felt your frustration. Well, my turn to speak now, and... Uh, you can tell by the slide, I title is uh, The Perfect Husband. And I thought just the title itself would elicit some laughter. But this and didn't, I'll tell a joke. <laughs> there were several gentlemen in, a, uh, in the locker room of one of these private men's clubs. And a uh, man was sitting on the bench and the cell phone right there next to him started ringing and he picked it up and said hello and uh, the lady on the other end said oh honey it's me oh sugar yes yes I'm at the club well great uh, I'm calling you because I was at the mall and I saw a beautiful mink coat on sale it's absolutely gorgeous, and it's half price. It's only $10,000. <laughs> what do you think? Well, honey, that's such a good price. Well, if you like it that much, you just go ahead and get it. Oh, thank you very much, but that's not all. <laughs> On the way to the shopping mall, I stopped at the Mercedes car dealership. <laughs> And you remember that car we were looking at? It was $100,000. Well, he told me he'd give it to me for $60,000. What do you think? Well, that sounds quite good, sweetie. Go ahead, get it. What a deal. Fantastic. Well, there's one more thing. You remember that special house we've been looking at? The one with the English garden and a acre of special gardens in the front as well as the back and it's located near the beach and remember they were asking a million dollars for it well they've come down to eight hundred thousand well I'll tell you what um, that's a good price go 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 ahead and uh, express interest but bid a little bit lower than that and maybe you can get a good deal oh sweetie what a day you've made this for me getting my fur coat, I'm getting a new Mercedes, and, and we might just get this car too, or this property too. I am so excited. Thank you so much. I just love you so much. Bye-bye, sweetie. Bye. He closed his cell phone and said, hey, whose phone is this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Those who know cell phones got it right away. Uh, now, the joke is funny to me for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that the context of the joke is a total misrepresentation of the perfect husband. A uh, perfect husband isn't one that just indulges your every wish, uh, all, even though that's what a wife might like. <laughs> but uh, one of the interesting things about context is it's involved in some of the most famous words that Jesus spoke in Scripture. And uh, in the course of my sermon, I want to show you some of the things he said. And when you see the context that he was drawing from when he said them, it'll have a more profound and uh, more appreciated meaning for you. But before we go there, I want to show you that the results are in from international contests on the best husbands in particular countries. On the next slide, you see the winning Husband of the Year Award in the UK. You can see he sleeps inside the tent, but um, and he's sleeping on a pad. <laughs> uh, well, she sleeps outside, and uh, he was voted the best husband. Well, at least she has a blanket to sleep on. 
<laughs> so what a, what a good caring husband he is. Not to be outdone, here's the entry for the husband of the year in the USA. You can see he's just smoking a cigarette while he ensures that she's getting her proper cardiovascular. <laughs> Okay, you're not impressed by the UK or USA. Let me show you Poland's husband of the year. She's a great wife because look at that. She's carrying six cases of beer. And uh, of course it's raining and he's using the umbrella. He doesn't, you know, want to impede her progress, blinding her by holding the umbrella over her. He's just being so thoughtful. Okay, you're not impressed by Poland. Let me show you Greece. <laughs> Look at that. You know, he's staying several feet ahead of her, so he's not impeding her progress as she carries this heavy load. What a thoughtful husband. Notice that he's smoking, and of course she's not, so that she doesn't impair her lungs. <laughs> Well, let's just look at the husband of the year in Serbia. See how thoughtful he is? He's not only giving his wife a ride, but his mother-in-law as well. <laughs> Delightful way to travel in a cage. But my last and final entry, and this one I'm most impressed with, is the husband of the year award for Ireland. As you can see, he's helping her. <laughs> She's carrying a full case of beer, and I want you to notice how strong she is. She's carrying it with one hand so that she can hold his other hand as they walk together. And notice he's helping by carrying one six-pack. <laughs> now, I'm sure, ladies, you would all agree that this, these entries are just real close to perfect husbands, <laughs> as I say with my tongue very deeply in my cheek. But if that isn't enough, let me explain, ladies, that men, as they get older, they suffer from a deterioration of hearing. They just can't hear as well as they used to hear as when they were younger. And this truncated listing that men suffer from uh, ends up with miscommunication. On the next slide, I give you an example of that. She says... Go to the store, lay down the mulch, wash and wax the car, get the kids at school, rent some videos, and finish the rest of the dishes. Now, because of the deterioration in the auditory processes of a male, this is what he hears on the next slide. Go, lay down, and get some rest. Indeed, she said all those words. So you see, then we have an uphill battle. I mean, even our very hearing processes deteriorate, which makes it even all the more difficult to be the perfect husband. And to show you the length of deterioration that occurs in the hearing and auditory process, the next slide says it all. She says, you never listen to me. Only you hear what you want to hear. He says, sure, I'll have another beer. <laughs> they sound alike. It works. And of course... As I said, hearkening back to that opening joke, the perfect husband is seen by some as the one who indulges his wife in everything. And on the next slide, I give you an example of that. Even doing the ironing. <laughs> my wife used to do all the ironing for me. But then when she saw me like this with my shirt off, she wanted me to do all the ironing thereafter. <laughs> so, there's a kernel of truth in this mythical a quest for the perfect husband. There is a perfect husband, but ladies, if you're waiting for one, I show you this next slide. You'll be waiting a long time because there are no perfect men save for one, Jesus Christ. Now, what got me thinking about weddings lately is in the last several months, both my children have gotten wed. And uh, let me share what they look like. You can see my daughter, Stephanie, and her husband, Evan. They, they got married, uh, well, what was that, uh, August? 
October. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Not only does the auditory process go, <laughs> but the memory starts to fade too. So they got married in October, and uh, they had a, um, a, a real interesting ceremony. I have to tell you this. Um, my daughter uh, finished her master's degree at Cal State Fullerton in uh, English and literature. And she now teaches at uh, community college level. And uh, when she saw our wedding ceremony, uh, she said, well, no, this, first of all, this is too long. And uh, uh, it, and it just doesn't flow right, Dad. It just doesn't flow right. So I sent her several other wedding ceremonies from other churches. And uh, she looked at it and said, I, she said, I knew it was going to require this, but I'm just going to have to write my own ceremony. And I said, all right, that's fine, dear. Just go ahead and write your own ceremony. And she did. And uh, actually, I was quite impressed with it. At first, just reading it, I thought it was a bit hokey. But, um, but then when I saw it performed, I was actually quite moved. Um, it, it, I would explain it as counseling 101 <laughs> as part of the marriage ceremony. Yeah. It was quite Shakespearean, if you will. And her and her husband each had lines that they spoke to each other. Um, and it, it was built into the ceremony. So the person, our pastor, Randy Bloom, who performed the ceremony for them, he said, uh, Stephanie, uh, there'll be times when Evan makes you angry. And Evan said, yes, this is true. <laughs> is that your intent? No, nay, never. <laughs> and they went back and forth. There were times when he will be frustrating you. There are times when she will be making you angry. And is this your intent? No, it is not. Anyway, it got very Shakespearean and went back and forth. And it turned out to be quite beautiful. And it made Tammy and her mom cry. And I confess, my eyes got a bit misty too. Relationship is a powerful source of change. And Megan was alluding to that in her testimonial. And just to tell you a little inkling of a story about my son, since he just got married, and uh, um, we really enjoyed his ceremony as well. It was a small, it was a private wedding up in Seattle with our retired pastor, Bill Miller, doing it. But um, I have to tell you this story. Uh, Joe and his friend uh, would have dinner parties uh, he, his friend that he went to college with was uh, someone who uh, grew up in Italy and uh, got a good job here after graduation. And they would do dinner parties. And when I say dinner parties, Joe and his friend built our, their foodies. And they really, when they, it, it's not just a casserole you get when, when you go to their house. They do a five course meal with non-alcoholic and alcoholic beverages paired with each course. And they have a sous vide cooker. Um, this is a thing you, you cook the food in a sealed pouch immersed in water. And you can control the temperature to one tenth of a degree and get a perfect cook on the meat. Anyway, this is, these are the extent that I mean, they cook with blow torches and all kinds of other equipment. This is the extent they go to prepare a meal. And, and they would have a dinner party once a week, invite different ladies over for dinner. And uh, he, he said, Dad, you would not believe it. The ladies just stand in line to come to our house to eat. I said, well, yeah, why don't you invite your mom and me, too? <laughs> so um, this young lady, Lapio, uh, was there for one of the dinners and really appreciated it. And uh, she's a nurse. And she lives rather frugally. She doesn't have a television. And she would watch the Cubs baseball games on her little laptop computer. She grew up in Alaska and became a Chicago Cubs fan. Alaska doesn't have any national or American League baseball teams. And they get the WGN television station from Chicago. And so a lot of people in Alaska are Chicago Cubs fans, as is Slapio and her family. And she noticed when she was having this wonderful meal at Joe's place, that he has this 70 inch flat screen on the wall. And so the next week she called and said, 
you know, Joe, I would like to watch the Cubs game, but I watch it on my little computer. I don't have a TV. Could I come watch it at your place? Well, sure, come on over. And uh, I'll uh, make us some drinks and a charcuterie platter and we'll have a big deal here. So, uh, Joe, since he was an infant to adulthood, shunned sports. He did not like sports at all. Zero interest in sports. Uh, in imperial schools, with, in elementary schools, the teachers would make him participate because he didn't like sports at all. I would take him to major league games to try and interest him in the game. And by the second inning, we, after we've had popcorn and peanuts and ice cream and every other food they have to offer at Dodger and Angel Stadiums, he'd say, okay, can we go now? <laughs> Just zero interest. Well, I would say, Joe, this is in his teenage years, why don't we, uh, you know, make a cheese plate, get some Belgian beer, and watch the game? And he would say, well, why don't we make a cheese plate, get some Belgian beer, and skip the game? What do we need the game for? <laughs> so that's how much he was disinterested in sports. But now, Lapio says, can I watch the Cubs game on your big TV? Oh, by all means, come right over. Well, this, uh, they'd been dating for a couple of years, and uh, I was totally unaware of this development. Until one day, my cell phone got a text message from my son, and it said, Dad, are you watching the Cubs game? It's in extra innings. And I texted back and said, who is this <laughs> who has my son's cell phone? <laughs> well, the rest is history. They're now married, and he is now a Cubs fan. <laughs> and he wears his Cubs baseball cap. And what I couldn't do for 20 years, make him a baseball fan, she did in just one week. Amazing the powerful source of change that is involved in relationship. So... They're married now, and it's interesting as I've gone through the two ceremonies with my kids and looking to scripture, we find that there really is no formal wedding ceremony find, found in scripture. You know, each Christian denomination has pretty much written their own. And of course it's based on all kinds of good things found in scripture. Um, and that's why we take you to Ephesians 5, 28, verses 28 and 29. We read, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Now, that's a pretty high standard, gentlemen. Although for some gentlemen, apparently it isn't. <laughs> he who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So we see here Jesus gives us a standard for a marriage relationship for, us, for the husband to love his wife as they love their own body. Now what's interesting, as I've already alluded to, there's no formal marriage ceremony in Scripture. There are some things mentioned in Scripture that have survived from ancient times till today that are, have always been part of a marriage ceremony. It is food, clothing, and a bed. And it's interesting, when you look at Ephesians 5, you see that those things are there. That Jesus nourishes and cherishes the church. Now, when Paul wrote this in Ephesians 5, it was in the first century. And he wasn't making it up as he went along. Uh, he would be quite familiar with what they did in the Jewish communities when it came to marriage ceremonies, when it came to the contract of marriage. And uh, looking through, well, Google was not as helpful as I would have liked for it to be, but looking through history, trying to find old marriage covenants, I came across one that was... Uh, translated uh, from the Aramaic, and I gave my source, you can see it on the next slide, 
You will be my wife according to the law of Moses and the Judeans. I will feed you and clothe you, and I will bring you into my house by means of your ketubah. And I owe you the sum of 400 denarii, which equals 100 tetradromics, whichever you wish to take and to, and you know, of course, the documents are very old and words are missing, together with the due amount of your food and your clothes and your bed. So they're going to provide, you know, stuff to eat and a shelter, nice place to sleep and shelter from the elements. Now, this ketubah is an interesting word. It was a prenuptial agreement that was written and was very much part of the culture of Israel, and not just Israel, but uh, cultures all the way back to uh, ancient times. In fact, on pottery, dated back to the second century BC, all the way back even to 500 BC, you find these ketubas, these marriage contract statements, on pottery, uh, or sometimes ornately done. And uh, they didn't have that kind of way of sealing the plastic back then, as people do today, uh, to display on the wall or on the pot that you regularly drink from. But what's interesting is these three things are always mentioned, that you'll be give, given food, clothing, and have a place in a house or a bed. Now, what's interesting about these ancient ketubas or these prenuptial agreements is that there's always a price that the potential husband pays to the family of the bride. And in this case, uh, this one was 400 denarii. 400 denarii would have been about mm, 33,000 American U.S. dollars. Not bad. I don't know if I had to pay that for Tammy, we'd have been waiting longer uh, than we did. But uh, there was always a price paid, and uh, and I guess uh, if you want to honor the intent of that uh, today, I, I guess you should increase your wife's clothing allowance. <laughs> now, going all the way back to the book of Exodus, and I, on the next slide, show you Exodus 21, 7 to 11, uh, and Exodus, Exodus is traditionally thought of as being written around 1400 B.C., we see some of the seeds or the kernels of this ketubah or these prenuptial wedding contracts. We read, if a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as men servants do. If she does not please the master who has selected her for himself, he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has broken faith with her. If he selects her for his son, he must grant her the rights of a daughter. If he marries another woman, he must not deprive the first one of her food, clothing, and marital rights. If he does not provide her these three things, she is to go free without any payment of money. So I go back to this 1400 BC verse from the book of Exodus to show you that from earliest times, these three things were part of the marriage covenant. And just specifying for food and clothing and a place to sleep, those things aren't very romantic sounding. And so as time progressed, they began to make the language more exciting, more romantic. And I have a copy of a 10th century Jewish merit certificate. Um, it's from the Karaite movement. The Karaite movement was a group of uh, Jews who looked to the Bible as the legal source of all law. They looked at the rabbis and said the rabbis were going off track. The rabbis are relying too much on oral tradition and the Talmud. And we got to get back to the basics, the Bible. And we don't need all this oral law. So they were a Jewish uh, political kind of movement. But here's an example of one of those ketubas, or those marriage contract prenuptial agreements. I desire of my own will to marry, fill in the wife's name, <laughs> that I might bring her into my house so that she will be my wife on condition that I honor her, feed her, sustain her, esteem her. You see, that's a little more romantic sounding than I'm going to give her a bed and some food and some clothes. So, 
and what he is good for the goose is good for the gander. Not only is he going to feed, sustain, and esteem her faithfully, she undertook to honor, esteem, and attend and serve him in the manner of a decent woman, the daughters of Israel who attend and serve and stand before their husbands in purity and sanctity. So, this honoring, sustaining, and esteeming is again something that Paul is emphasizing in Ephesians 5. If we go back there now, notice what he says. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And after all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does for the church. So we see that the foundation of all Christian wedding ceremonies, prenuptial agreements from ancient times, all included these three things that we find from Exodus all the way through to present times. Now, on my final slide, I have a note here celebrating Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And what I want to conclude with is the context of some of the words Jesus said when he spoke to his disciples uh, there in that Passion Week and that time before he died. And some of the information I'm about to tell you, you can read for yourself in the uh, Universal Jewish Encyclopedia. Their article on marriage is uh, quite interesting. And it gives a wonderful description of Jewish marriage customs going all the way back through the first century. But living in our modern age, we don't catch the full significance of Jesus' words or his statements to his disciples and the stated promises he made to them because we're not familiar with the Jewish ketubah or the Jewish prenuptial marriage covenant agreement. Okay, so... Jesus is drawing from those when he speaks to his disciples. And let me read just a small bit from the encyclopedia article. There were several steps from proposal of marriage to the consummation of the wedding union. The first major step in a Jewish marriage was betrothal. That is, betrothal was the establishment of a marriage covenant. The young man prepared a ketubah, or a marriage contact, contract or covenant, which he presented to the intended bride and her father. Now, during Jesus' earthly days, it was usual for such a covenant to be established as a result of the prospective bridegroom taking the initiative. Continuing on, the groom would travel from his father's house to the home of the prospective bride to negotiate with the father of the bride to determine the mohar, that is, that price, that must be paid to purchase his bride. Once agreed upon and the purchase price paid, the marriage covenant was thereby established, and the young man and woman were regarded to be husband and wife, even though the wedding ceremony had not taken place, nor anything else. But from that moment on, the bride was declared to be consecrated or sanctified, set apart exclusively for her bridegroom. As a symbol of the covenant relationship that had been established, the groom and bride would drink from a cup of wine over which the betrothal benediction had been pronounced. With the negotiations complete, the custom was for the young man's father to pour a cup of wine and hand it to his son. His son would turn to the young woman, lift the cup and hold it out to her, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which I offer for you. Really poetic way of saying, I love you. I'll give you my life. Will you marry me? Don't miss those words, right? This cup, the new covenant, my blood, I do this for you. Sound familiar? Yeah, you know where it comes from. If the proposal was accepted, either the young man or the father of the bride would pour a cup of wine for his beloved and wait to see if she drank it. This cup represents a blood covenant. If she drank the cup, 
That meant she accepted the proposal and would be betrothed. She could answer without saying a word. All she had to do was drink from the cup. But by drinking from the cup, it was her way of saying, I accept your offer. I give my life in response. The young man then would give gifts to his beloved and take his leave. The young woman would have to wait for him to return to collect her part of the wedding ceremony. Before leaving the house, after they've poured the wine and she drank it, the man, the young man, the prospective bridegroom would announce, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Sound familiar? You know where those words were spoken. You see the deeper context involved when you realize Jesus was speaking from the marriage tradition. You see why Paul uses the analogy throughout the New Testament that he's coming to marry the church, that the church is his bride. And you see the language that he uses there in Ephesians. It's wonderful. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples sat together, celebrating Passover. The disciples knew the liturgy very well. They had celebrated Passover all their lives. When it came time to drink the third cup of wine, that is the cup of redemption as it was known as this in the Seder meal, the disciples would expect and offer traditional Seder thanks, which would be, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, for giving us the fruit of the vine. Jesus said something they probably did not expect when he said, this cup is a new covenant which I offer to you. <coughs> Being good Jewish boys, they knew that ceremony. They knew what was meant. They understood that this was a blood contract that he was making. There are many meanings to the statement, but one of them in common, ordinary language, was it was a way of saying I love you. And that's the beautiful picture of what Jesus says to us through the disciples in that ceremony when we do it. And I pray and hope that every time from this day forward, when you participate in the Lord's Supper, you'll remember the deeper context of those words. Amen.